gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for us to be here today, the day after the opening of our exhibition, Out of Ink, which shows uh, the work of 13 artists from China being presented actually in Turkey for the first time here. So we have a very big thank you to the Pera Museum for giving us this wonderful platform and this opportunity to be here. So today, we're, thank you. <laughs> today we have with us three of the artists who came for the exhibition. Um, two of them came because they did very particular installations for the show. Uh, Mr. Zhang Jianjun, who I'm sure <laughs> you would have seen has this incredible room full of text. And I think that he will explain to you when he talks about his work, but for him, he was most excited to have the result that he has here in Istanbul because he's done this project before in China, but here was able to have the most uh, diverse amount of language, uh, different calligraphic styles and different texts that combined, which I think you feel is a very good reflection of the cultural life of Istanbul as well. And then next to him, we have Mr. Joe Fan, who's one of our youngest artists. Yeah? And I think it's a reflection of the age, maybe, that he grew up in, that he has this incredible, unmissable, bright, very, very detailed, intense ink works that are on the fifth floor. Um, if you've seen them, you would know the three very bright pink-ish uh, and day glow color works yeah so this is a, a very very beautiful series that he's been working on each one of them done in what i think for most of the works you might see here is something that looks like it should be done very straightforward very fast but actually takes months and months of painstaking brushwork to complete so welcome johan and then we have our other artist who was here for the installation this is tang bo hua and his work is also on the third floor. And this is, as you go in to the third floor, on the opposite side to Zhang Jianjun's work. And also with this wonderful painting on the wall that is the setting for his animation work. And again, it's a remarkable animation work um, that took him a year of research plus years to put together and um, is the result of t more than 10,000 individual uh, boards that were created to make this animation and multiple other elements along the way. So, good to have you here. So, I thought maybe I'd just say a little bit about the exhibition and why it's a very special exhibition in my view. Um, and then each of the artists is going to introduce a little bit about their work and the way they work. Um, and then we hope that we will have some questions from you. So I just say a little bit about it's ink, but it's out of ink. Why is it out of ink? Because we are looking here at the work of contemporary artists. So we're looking at something that is not specifically within the Chinese tradition. This very long and proud tradition of ink painting which has unfolded over more than 2,000 years. And this um, tradition probably has its acknowledged height in the Tang Dynasty, which is already 1,000 years ago. So you can imagine through this period of time, almost every way of painting with every type of brush, every type of material, every type of paper has been tried. So how do we find a way to make this tradition modern? And that's what's really interesting about the work of these 13 artists. Because what's also interesting is if we showed this exhibition in China, perhaps most people who know about ink would say, this is not ink. This is not anything to do with the ink tradition as we understand it. But I've been in China for 27 years, always looking at the contemporary art and because I'm a foreign person there, always acting as a bridge between two worlds, trying to find ways to show what's going on, um, to explain it. 
And this is a really interesting moment to look at something like ink because we've had many exhibitions of the kind of international contemporary art that you would see at the Venice Biennale, that you probably see here in Istanbul at your own Biennale. Um, and it's always a time when you face this big international platform of how does an artist find something within their own culture, which is their own tradition that they can draw on, um, but that somehow fits with the international world. So they're neither parochial, but they're neither leaving entirely their tradition behind. So I think that the work of the artists here is a real good example of individual personalities, researching, thinking, looking from their contemporary perspectives at how this tradition might sit with the modern world. Um, and one of the reasons why I liked this exhibition title being Out of Ink is that somehow it's coming from a tradition, but the idea is that it maybe will go beyond and that perhaps it will open up new possibilities for people to work with this tradition in the future. And so my understanding of this tradition in the most part is not the ink itself, but it's the spirit. And the spirit that I feel is at work here is really about how the individual looks at themselves within the outside world. And this is very central to Chinese philosophy, and it's always about finding your way in the world, about living in harmony, somehow living in balance, um, and just finding, I guess, a, a poetic way to interact with the world where you're not actually causing too much disruption. It's an interesting philosophy. Anyway, so I just wanted to give you that little bit of a background to the thinking about why I brought these artists together. I'm sure you want to hear much more about their thinking. So we're going to begin today with Zhang Jinjun, who I hope you won't mind me saying is one of the older artists in the exhibition. And this is kind of important because his experience as a young man um, was kind of a little bit clipped, we could say, because he grew up under the Cultural Revolution times in China, which was a period of very strong political ideology when it was only the official ideology that was art. And I think people didn't really talk about art. It was just all visual language commandeered to making the political messages. So as soon as that ended and China began to open up in the 1980s, he was one of the first artists to start experimenting in abstract art, um, using all kinds of materials that previously had been considered were not art at all. Um, he also was one of the early artists to leave China and to take up residence in New York, where he's been on and off now since 1989. Um, he's a professor at the uh, New York University campus, previously in New York, but now in, in Shanghai itself. But he's never stopped making art, obviously, and always using this experience of being between the East and the West, which has been a very important element in the development of contemporary Chinese art. So, why don't you tell us about your work? He doesn't know what slides I've chosen, so I'm going to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw right. things at him to begin right. with. So, here we are. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, dear friends. Very happy to uh, be here to share in my experience, art experience with everyone. And just like Karen just mentioned, I'm very excited. Uh, my, art, my art show in Istanbul, that's my first trip to Turkey, to Istanbul. So before I want to mention my uh, art activity development, I want to mention about uh, the work I show in the third floor here. And this is the second version of the uh, work called Vestige of Process. Uh, I guess I can follow this. Yeah, you, you, you follow <laughs> right. that. Okay. Yeah. This is an, uh, in Dunhuang uh, Cave. And in 1979, after Cultural Revolution finished over, I went to uh, Dunhuang. I was so uh, excited and also stunned because uh, before I was in art school, I learned art. Um, it's like uh, my professors from uh, 
Russia, for, former Soviet Union, or French, like a Cezanne style. And, but whatever I do, experimental work, is everything is I paint what I haven't seen is three dimensional. Once I went to Dunhuang, I got a shock. Everything is go inside. Can we and just explain that Dunhuang is a series of caves in the far west of China. I think it might be a little bit like the caves you have in Cappadocia, which also have incredible murals. But this particular group of caves is at the beginning of what was the original Silk Road, which of course began in China and ended here. And merchants used to leave from China and would ask a painter to make a painting inside the caves as a kind of a blessing for their journey. And so this group of caves now has a history of painting in China that's over 2,000 years, is that right? right, right. And they're quite uh, extraordinary to see. So, and that's where he went in 1979. Thank you, yeah. And because uh, besides the uh, ever since going hit my inside spiritually, because that's so different I learned before the paintings to express what I'm seeing. And also, Dunhuang has been developed for over a thousand years. And during the time, there's so many different cultures how to influence or uh, integrate. So for instance, this one from the Northern Wei Dynasty. And what period is the Northern Wei? Northern Wei is, but I, I believe that's also like very much a lot of a Turkish culture. Fifth century. Fifth, Fifth century. century, yeah. Fifth century. And so, I mean, I think the Dunhuang experience for me is not just uh, the art technique. It's really changed my mind, changed the, the way how to do artworks. So uh, when I, I remember, I spent like a, almost a month in the cave, in uh, stay in Dunhuang uh, Institute, institution, and doing artwork and walking around, just thinking. And then when I back to Shanghai, I suddenly I don't know how can I continue my artwork anymore because uh, that's such a conflict. And and then, uh, like I mentioned, I was born in Shanghai. In even Revolution time, Shanghai is a very much like Western influence city. So when I grew up, I never look at the Chinese tradition. And so even after Cultural Revolution over, I have a chance to read, I mean from abroad, and all the novels and musics and philosophical things, everything, but never is the Chinese tradition. And from Dunhuang and the cave, the trip, I back to Shanghai, I start to look at Taoism, Buddhism, Indian Buddhism, and many other uh, those ancient culture. Took me for year, two years, and for instance, like that one is a Da Zhuan, it's an ancient Chinese calligraphy. And so that's the moon, sun, and the man. So I try to use in those uh, calligraphy shape, but of course the color is still very much like a uh, focus, the style of Rouas. Uh, at that time, I'm very much also look at the, the French painters of Rouas work. So uh, there's some start some combination. Yeah, and the next one? Uh, yes, uh, that's 1982, two years after. Uh, I think I pretty much like uh, see from a very bright color to black and white. And also the nature material directly, uh, directly into my uh, the canvas. I use a stone, I later use the wood, mm. and the paper, and the ink. So uh, you will see like a balance, you will see this uh, dialogue between, between nature and also, uh, uh, yeah, see, there's some like a stone, but uh, originally I used a uh, natural stone, but getting bigger, bigger, heavier, heavier, then suddenly I saw I used a paper mache, and mm -hmm. inside paper mache have a real stone. Mm -hmm. So that's really fit like a, uh, the first nature and second nature, which is always a dialogue with nature. Mm -hmm. If some like a stock paper is represent cultural thing, and ink, and wood, and the uh, 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 the wood, and the others is more like nature, mm -hmm. and the ink is more like a mm -hmm. cultural understanding. So in this period of time, uh, in the 80s, 
we see what is called like a cultural spring across China. Um, but it was still quite rare that artists were using abstract language. Uh, one of the interesting things is that when people, artists, refer to nature in works like this in China, they do, about, including in the, the ink painting, they don't always think of them as being abstract in the way that we might think of them as being abstract. Right, so, because during that time, like we talked about the early 80s, we, have not, we don't have many information about the world. And because I remember that time we made a chance to see uh, the, uh, if you say abstraction, I think Kandinsky, that's the mm. one. Otherwise, uh, a lot of us are uh, uh, impressionists or expressionists, mm. those works. But what's interesting about the work that uh, we just showed from Jin Jun about the sun and the moon is that he's painting the characters, but making, returning the characters to being like a picture I guess like an Egyptian hieroglyphic or as they were originally supposedly created to describe like the sun and the moon, the shape. Yes, and yeah. also today I'm so surprised, it's astounding that I saw this shape, this pattern in uh, uh, archaeology museum in Istanbul today. Oh, it's you did? Yeah, okay. So like, wow, okay. <laughs> there's something <laughs> cross. Yeah, but anyway, so JJ moved to New York and you didn't return for the first time to Shanghai until after six years. And there was a big clash then because you'd been in the West, even though Shanghai was a Western city, you felt when you grew up. And that really changed the way that you made work after that. It evolved around this clash between East and West, which I think also is in this, this work as well. Yeah, so exactly, because uh, uh, when I left China in the uh, later 80s, and I, I received fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation, and I went to New York. And of, of course, there's such a uh, uh, con contrast when I, uh, I mean, even I growing up in Shanghai, it's very, very Western influence, but in New York, that's so different. And but for me, I really, uh, appreciate that experience is that I can physically I can uh, to to into the contemporary art movement at the same time I look at back China and also look at the Chinese tradition I kind of like a you know that's the Chinese idiom Kan Yuan Kan Cheng Shan means you with the distance you really see the mountain you get closer you see details but mm -hmm. so from that uh, perspective I, I think it really changed my art uh, work. And more and more because uh, in New York, see people from all different nations, different countries, with different religion, different cultures. More, I thought, uh, human being, we uh, we are landing where together. So there's a, so a lot of my work started working on something beyond the cultural difference, be, uh, uh, between religion difference. For instance, this one, this work, I called footprint. I did this one in, uh, in Japan, Tokyo, in uh, 1997, so 22 years ago. So what I did is uh, in the space, the museum space, I built a, a, a stone island, and the underneath is a hollow. So it's a, a water mixed with the sumi ink, with ink, circulate hmm. running. And then uh, on the top, on the top of the, uh, the stone island, they have a footprint I kept from a male and a female, and young and old, and then uh, from different nations, and lining a circle, almost like a human monument. But then, um, in the museum's floor, I lined up a very fine canvas. So the audience, the visitors, when they come, they take off shoes, they walk from the space, they're walking over the island, they're walking down the footprint cap on the floor, mm -hmm. day by day, and cross over. Because uh, I think the footprint, we all very individual. No matter you are a rich people, or your president, or your your students, everyone's equal, and just cross. And also, one of the, my art uh, style is I give, a, I give a, a, a freedom, a chance to the the work how to grow. Because for instance, like I don't know who come to the work, and then maybe the Danish, maybe Japanese, Chinese, uh, and American, people walk through, and then how to walk layer by layer, footprint spread out. So the top is 
it's a stay, the footprint, like a monument. Mm -hmm. And the floor every day spread out walking around. Yeah, you can see the detail there. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that one, you see the uh, footprint, the cast in the stone. Yeah. And here is um, uh, the visitors walking in the museum and then the foot, uh, catch the footprint. Mm. So the process is about three months. Right. So you wanted to show this piece as well. Yeah, How does I that lead from the footprints to this, to the work that's in the museum exactly, here? Exactly, exactly. Because that's again, uh, uh, it's uh, I call uh, chanting with rock, playing with water. I made like a, a landscape, have a mountain, have a river, have a stone, and see here the rock. Um, I select this. Chinese scholar rock, but I cast to the silicon, uh, silicon rubber, which is also transferred from the nature elements to the very modern or uh, postmodernism industrial materials. And then also put the color, it's that year. That's the one I did in 2000, 2013. And then also there's some paper mache I made a, a, like a bird or seed. And surround, and also see this. Uh, uh, frame that's a rice paper. I have a three projectors. Project the image of a water. Some water I shoot from New York and Shanghai and in, in Europe and running water because water moving lines almost like, ab like the uh, calligraphy line, also mm -hmm. like abstract. Yeah. And at the same time, also there's another <coughs> image of a water. For instance, like Tom Dennis painting or Van Gogh's. Uh, painting for water, or Japanese, and all different cultures uh, painting for water. So I project this on the rice paper and in the different, different timing. So, and during the time, you see I, I using the calligraphy brush, yeah. dip on the wall, and I draw those lines showing the images on the rice paper. Of course, underneath of the rice paper, I made some layer. So once water wet the paper, the shows looks like an ink, mm. dark. But uh, within time, once the water evaporates, the line disappeared. And sometimes the line still there, but then the video images change. Mm. See this water is always flowing, adapting, because uh, with nature, water images, and uh, with, with culture, different land, water images. So they always integrate, move, and uh, that's uh, another, yeah, that's the... Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. here we come to the beginning of the project that's here, and when was this <coughs> done? This one I did in, in Xi'an, ah. right? I that's the one in, is that not the one in Shanghai, before Xi'an? That oh, one's okay. Xi'an. Yeah, 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 okay. That first one, that one, uh, I, I did it three, <laughs> three times, so one yeah. in Shanghai. Sorry, and oh, wrong uh, way. No. Going backwards, sorry, 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 yeah. I jumped ahead. No. So I did it in Shanghai and in Portland Gallery, and then a second version I did in Xi'an. Because the first and second, it's a, it shared the same concept. Right. And the third one that's in Xi'an will change. Yeah. yeah. That's a Xi'an. So maybe we just, because the mm -hmm. text that's being used for this project mm -hmm. is called the thousand character text. And it's very important um, in Chinese culture. One thing, it's a thousand characters that never repeat. It also is a beautiful poem that is a bit like um, sort of Beowulf, you know, it's or Ho Homer's Odyssey. You know, it's like an epic poem about a hero, but actually what it's telling is how to be a good person. And it's really describing all the moral values that one should ascribe to uh, within the times and in the culture. And so what's really interesting, of course, is that it is a, a, a text that people learn by memory in China. And for calligraphers, it's one of those texts that if you want to be a good calligrapher, you would copy and copy and copy until you can do it off by heart. Um, so the project began by giving people, uh, it's, it's, it's always, uh, four characters in each line, that's a poetic sort of measure in Chinese. And so you gave the people the chance to choose the characters they liked, maybe they could understand them, maybe they couldn't, and then to just write them on the wall however they wanted, is that right? right. And then you introduced the element of punctuation, the colors which you see in the space. 
And that's an important element because right up until almost 100 years ago to the day, uh, May the 4th will be the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement, which was the young people suggesting that China really need to modernize. And it was at that point that the way of writing was simplified so that ordinary people could write and punctuation was introduced to give the language more of a sense that you, you could write as you spoke and that then it would become something that ordinary people could use because prior to that it was really the language of scholars and something that only the learned elite had access to. So this was a big transformation and JJ uses the color for the punctuation symbols in the work to kind of really mark that first step into modernity. And also, um, I will hear, I will say, all the uh, participants, assistants, volunteers, it's so important for this project because uh, I myself spend time, I can paint it over the whole place, but that's only my spirit, only my way. I want to, that's why and in my work I always invite many uh, uh, volunteers from, uh, uh, from the people living in the here and in the different uh, background and each one right left their, their message, their feeling, their spirit. So that's a combining together. I think that's a, uh, back to my original work is so we're sharing, mm. sharing the space, sharing together. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So that brings to there. So we will come next to Tang Bo Hua because the work sort of links on a little bit. Uh, Tang Bo Hua also went to Dong Huang, um, part of the younger generation, really interested to look back at the cultural history. He spent a whole year in Dong Huang. Um, researching with a small team of people so there's another element there that actually he has people who help and research with him to complete his projects we're going to start here this is the beginning the animation downstairs the country of summer in insects and what he works with here is a very interesting proverb in Chinese um, which is open to interpretation so one of the ways that we can perhaps understand this is that here you have this idea that an insect is born with a finite period of time to exist. Often born in the spring and died in the autumn before the winter comes. So would have no knowledge of the winter or something like ice. So he uses this as a way of thinking about this idea of curiosity, is it your way, your right, to go out and try and learn something of the world that's not normally within your cultural framework or within your remit? Um, there are many, many other different kinds of ways of interpreting this, other similar proverbs that talk about um, ignorance and understanding. But I think we should let him describe a little bit about how this project began and also how he decided to use this particular style to create the work. And I'll just say one little thing about the beginning because one of my, my job is that I work for a museum in Xi'an, um, which is where JJ just, we showed the project that he did. And these two kind of images that begin um, are a little bit related to Xi'an because we have the terracotta warriors there, which is a remarkable piece of historic um, creativity. Um, but it's also a place where there's lots of very important stone carvings. So one of the things you see in the city a lot are these prints that are made from the stone, which look like this because they take the rice paper and then a big, um, like soft cloth muller, which is dipped in black ink and then put onto the stone to take an impression of the text. Anyway, sorry, please tell us about your project. Uh, 我是汤博华。呃，我的英语不太好，所以只能用中文跟大家一起交流。很高兴跟大家交一起交流。Hello, uh, my name is Tom Bohua. I'm sorry, my English isn't very good, but I thank you so much for in, in having me come here. 呃，我的大学专业是版画。呃，但是呃，我们这一代就是属于中国文化。
巨大改变之后的成长起来的一代。In university, I studied printmaking, and、uh, I perhaps am the first example after the new education system started to have studied printmaking, so to speak. Which is about uh, uh, that new policy sort of begins around the 2000s, yeah. 对，就是我们。呃，以前的会画画画的人，还是读书的人，都会写字，都会用毛笔。但是在我们当下的年轻人来说，呃，即便是画画的人，都对毛笔这个工具，呃，有非常大的恐惧。Yes,、yeah, so the generations before me, uh, all the artists and calligraphers and writers, painters, they all know how to use brushes very well. But I'm the first generation that. Of my generation, that we feel a bit horrified or frightened of writing with brushes. And sorry, the brushes that he's talking about are these very particular Chinese brush. It's a long tapered brush, tapered to a point that you hold,、uh, you hold like this. I'm left-handed, so you're supposed to do like this, and you move in a very particular way with the point always straight down and right, curving right. Yeah. Because everyone is used to writing with pencils, not with brushes. 呃，但对于呃中国人来说，毛笔或者说水墨，呃，可能是像血血液一样的一个精神，或者说哲学美学的一个一个一个东西。呃、uh, ，Chinese students and Chinese people all have a basic understanding of calligraphy and writing and using a brush, but、uh, it runs in our veins, so to speak, the the the, the energy of brushwork. 对，就是呃，我就特别想，就是通过自己的创作，呃，希望去接续上这样的一个血液或者说一个根。So I would like to use my own method to continue this energy of or this spirit of the brush work into the future. 对，就是呃，我毕业创作之后，呃，就一直在做影像动画的创作。没有再继续做版画，呃，但在三楼大家看的这个片子第一部分，还是用了一些版画的概念，但是是用了古代画像砖拓印的一个方式。So ever since leaving the university, I haven't really done so much printmaking. I spent most of my time doing brushwork or painting. And if you notice my work on the third floor, within the videos, I've used a traditional Chinese method of using boards or Painting or printing on boards. 对，就是中国有句话，就是说传统丢失了，可能要去呃田野、乡野间再去寻找。So in China, we have a tradition that says、uh, losing your tradition or your history, you have to find a stronger, harder way to look forward to the future and to its tradition and the continuity of its tradition. 所以，当我面对创作一个片子的时候，很很多的这个意向就会来自于童年的记忆。So in the creation of my work, a lot of it depends. I'm inspired from my generation and from the things around me. 对，我的童年很有意思。我的老家是呃世界上做烟花最出名的地方。呃，因为烟花呃。就是我们小时候，呃，很容易去，呃，加入到这个烟花的这个生产中。So where I come from in China is a province which is very famous for hundreds of years making fireworks. Everyone is involved in the fireworking industry. So even as children, we all learn to play with or use fireworks and gunpowder. 对，长大之后觉得这个工作其实是特别有意思的一个一个工作，有点像把梦卖给别人。So it's quite interesting for me. It's like selling a dream to when these explosions happen. 呃，烟花用的都是非常普通的、常见的，或者说呃，类似于泥土一样的材料。So things that are used to make fireworks are very common things. But when it's a long process to create the firework, but when it explodes, it's creating a dream. 对，但是经过一系列的加工，它会呃最后变成一瞬间，跟梦一样在夜空中绽放。
So after a long time of working on this, like my work, I finally see the results. I'm adding a little bit to help <laughs> uh, to see the, the result. It's a long process to see the dream. 对，所以我我也特别感慨，就是呃，古代的人对于这样的一个转换时间的一个转换材料的一个转换，把特别简单的东西啊，化腐朽为为神奇，呃，最后做出一个如梦如幻的东西。So I really respect the my ancestors and the tradition, the tradition in China, that with something so simple that they are able to create endless or boundless dreams and magic. 对，所以我的动画片用了最最普通的一个,个材料，就是很多有用泥板或者说用石灰，呃，通过呃，谢荣国是通过三年的一个工作，然后最后呃完成了十七分钟的一个动画。So in the case of my video that goes with the work upstairs, it's taken me. It's a, I've used a very simple simple materials and simple fat. Plaster boards and painted on them, and it's taken me three years to do all of this work. It's all been reduced to 17 minutes. 对，还有就是烟花，呃，因为烟花生产非常的危险，非常的容易出现事故，所以我们当地呃有这个还保留了很多的民俗，就是希望有呃建了很多的庙，希望有神灵去保护，就是生产烟花的人能够健康平安。So in the production of fireworks, in fact, is very dangerous. And because of that, in the local area where we live, there are many temples uh, that we pray to, or we hope that the spirits will help us protect us while we're doing this work. Since you can see some of these in my work. So in childhood, you can often take a fire to make toys. And at the same time, you can also be in the temple, because it's very hot. So as young children, we're of course very mischievous. So we play with these fireworks and we take them to the temples and have them explode in the temple while the elders are explaining stories. 对，这也是呃，就是文化中的一种一种复杂的东西。就是呃，虽然这些修塑像的，呃，或者说画壁画的。没有像唐代的那么漂亮、那么好看，或者是画的画的那么优秀，但是他的呃工匠们的内心，他的一个虔诚，其实还是有无无穷大的一个力量。So I know, uh, for me, this is a cultural exercise. For example, it's a, a way of carrying on tradition in playing with the fireworks. So I know that my painting is not up to the standards of the Tang Dynasty, which is eighth century painting. But I feel it's a way to uh, communicate, and it's a fun way of carrying on a tradition for me. So I just finally used this time to explore the ancient tradition, especially because I think this kind of amazing animation is a way for me to So I think using this animation or this movement is a way for me to address the past and how to continue it forward, and I think it's a, quite, it's a quite unique way to preserve tradition and move it forward. Uh, so the animation or the video, I want to address the, 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 how minute people, how we are in the universe, in the entire Scale of the universe. We're quite small. So, 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 Yeah, that's perfect ending. I don't know, you, have you all had a chance to see the film? Um, I hope maybe you have some questions you can ask because the technique that he used is really special. And speaking of special technique brings us to Zhou Fan, whose painting is really quite uh, extraordinary. Um, when I first saw one of Zhou Fan's work, I, like probably many people, would assume that it was done by 
splashing work on the splashing ink onto paper in the way that we imagine sort of Jackson Pollock or other abstract artists in a fairly frenetic series of um, gestures throwing the ink down. But it's not until you have a chance to be close to the paper, which is what's very good here because we have it. Um, he's very graciously allowed us to put it on the wall without any glass so you can really see closely that every single part of the painting is, uh, this is just a detail, is done with a relatively small brush <laughs> and really in a very painstaking way, layer by layer. Um, and I hope I'm not giving too much away to describe that um, Joe Fan's method of working is not to map out the whole piece of paper before he starts. He doesn't come up with a composition and draw it all in pencil lines. He literally starts in one corner of the paper and then lets his hand and his mind, you know, just uh, see how the painting unfolds. So perhaps like with JJ, with his projects, never quite knows what it's going to look like before it's finished. Is that right? Okay. So this is a detail from downstairs. But this is one of the earlier works that uh, Joe Fan began with. So I thought we might begin by looking at some of them because this was when you were using oil and acrylic and incredibly detailed as well. It's actually a landscape, but using a little bit of a traditional form to be painting in a circle. It's not often seen, obviously, in Western painting, but it is something you do see a lot in Chinese painting. So we can start maybe talking a little bit about the complexity that you bring to your work. Why do you like to do things so complex and how did that all begin? Yeah, you're good. You're good. You can hear him. You can use the microphone if you like as well. Maybe you didn't turn it on. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and uh, talk about my works. Uh, so, um, uh, let's start from this uh, this painting. Actually, uh, uh, this is my early works, uh, maybe around uh, 2013, I think. So in that time, I always make so many uh, different uh, landscape painting, maybe. Uh, but in that time, I um, tried so, some different uh, material than my yeah, new see. works. Uh, Actually, it's uh, acrylic on the canvas, and uh, I make these paintings uh, spend me a lot of the time. Uh, for example, this one I uh, took uh, maybe two years ago to finish the whole paintings because I I, I should make the very very small details by the brush and uh, mark pen. So, and I. I always cover by the so many colors, uh, one by one, so many different uh, layers. And uh, so, yeah, uh, this one is uh, basically the uh, same time as I finished this one. So, um, this lens big pan uh, paintings gave me a, a sort of direction uh, of my career life. So, uh, uh, in that time, I always see you know, the sort of the, mm, some dif different situation uh, than, than now. So uh, in that time, I always uh, try to imagine, try to imagine uh, there must be somewhere uh, in our mind and uh, maybe come from our memory, somewhere you had been or not. So I try to find that uh, some different in the direction, give me uh, some information. It's sort of the, Im uh, just some uh, imaginary uh, sense. Mm -hmm. So I make make it and uh, basically I like use so many different colors. Uh, maybe uh, uh, one tree, I got uh, maybe 50 or more colors. Just uh, use uh, so many different colors. So in that time I got uh, some um, habit just like, so I think, I be, honest, be honestly, I got some uh, addiction of, of the colors or so many pattern, mm -hmm. yeah, basically. Yeah. So what's interesting is that for the landscape tradition, um, just as a phenomenon in China, 
people never tried to describe a place. They were never trying to paint somewhere that they'd actually seen. Every element in a painting is somehow metaphoric, has a, a, a meaning that when brought together, for example, we were today in the Topkapi Palace, which has this amazing collection of Chinese ceramics. And one of the ceramics we were looking at, Mike said, oh, that's the three friend. Three friends. Three three friends pattern, and it's uh, pine and lotus, is it? Oh. Pine, bamboo, and prunus. Okay, so three flowers that have this meaning of like nobility and friendship and uh, honesty, for example. And so this is what uh, Joe Fan is referring to when he says, I'm thinking about a place that's somewhere I've been, but he's not exactly describing it, it's a sensation, and I think what's important about your work is always this sensation of how you experience the outside world because you do use a lot of color and obviously the works here that we have are particularly colorful but there's always a slightly darker undertone to some of the work like almost like a, a fear of the outside world I think that the original spirit of the ink painting is a place that you're supposed to go and you know, take a walk in and find something that's very poetic, calming, meditative, something that's almost like a little paradise. But I don't know whether it's your generation or just your personal experience. Your worlds are a little bit more like, like jungles, you know. It's like more like looking at the Amazon. You know that it's beautiful, but you know there's lots of bugs in there that will just love to eat you if you do go in. Is that part of what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's true. okay. But where do you think that comes from? I mean, we see it in all these beautiful, I mean, you, sorry that um, these are pictures that I had, they're not super high quality. You don't get to see all the colors that Joe Fan's referring to, but they are extraordinary paintings when you do uh, see them in the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, this, this landscape actually is uh, half imaginary, uh, half uh, in reality, so, as you see in the uh, right side of this painting, actually, this is so many stuff living in the deep oceans, and uh, we can see top top level there's a forest. So I I make some uh, make some connection with a totally different space, and uh, put them together. So. Uh, I call that uh, 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 in China. I, I don't know how to say that word. It's a tan tu, sort of the swamp. Yeah, basically, it's sort of the swamp. So uh, in this picture, we can so yeah, so many uh, crazy yeah. details. And uh, actually, this one uh, I is my different uh, step. Uh, of my painting works uh, uh, during the 2014, I moved to Shanghai, so I started uh, my uh, different life, and I uh, I, I went a uh, very good studio in Shanghai, and so in that time I gave up so so many of my um, old old works because I think that, okay that's enough. It's uh, so crazy for me, and uh, I'm I always. Uh, got so many emo emotional stuff from my painting. So uh, in that time, I mm, make this uh, mm, sort of a different uh, paper works. Uh, all works just by the paper and the uh, ink pen. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, maybe this, this stuff has been uh, mm, four months ago, I think. Yeah, right. so uh, in that time I just tried to think, okay, uh, let me finish uh, the whole forest landscape just by the one pen and uh, one paper. Uh, for me, I think it's a sort of a, a spiritualizer or some imi imitation or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, for, me, uh, for me, I think uh, I, 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 I always think about uh, my old works till now, but uh, I think it's a totally different step for me. Mm. Yeah. And, and then you started to move from that black and white, but using very detailed mm -hmm. into color that's coming closer to where we are. 
yeah. with the works upstairs? Uh, yeah, this painting is uh, after that uh, black and white uh, paperwork, and uh, in that time, I, uh, in the 2015, uh, I had uh, uh, first uh, solo exhibition uh, with uh, Art Labor Gallery uh, in Shanghai. So in that time, I uh, it's, it's very interesting because I just uh, gave up the, my whole things before any, everything I done. Uh, because you know, uh, as artists, I think uh, I. I, I always got so many choices in my life, and, uh, and so in the time I think, okay, landscape should be continue, and uh, this is our reality world. Everyone know that, and uh, in the time I think, okay, uh, forest, that's enough, and because it's, uh, I, I, I just walking deeper and deeper, right. so that, this ma mountain uh, is uh, from my experience. So one time we got the traveling in the Wuyishan, it's the sort of side in China. And uh, uh, we go into this mountain and uh, we walk in the wild place because it's, it's not a tourist place right. to go into the mountain. So we're lost. I'm so panicked and uh, everyone, everyone is so panicked, so, so, so scary. But in that time, I just saw the whole place, okay, uh, the colors in, and uh, the sky's color and the whole mountain's colors from the green and the to yellow and the tangerine and the dark is uh, very good mm -hmm. for me. I mean, the, the, the experience. Uh, so I turned. I, I, I try so many different uh, memory from my mind and mm. put them on the papers. So like this, ba basically, yeah. so uh, yeah, sort of this <laughs> Like this. Mm. And this is where your world, you can feel it gets a bit more scary. Yeah. Is that right? Mm, yeah. But also a little bit, you know, this generation also using computers, I think, and the, some of the visual imagery reminds me of. I mean, I don't think it happens anymore, but with old analog computers, you know, sometimes your screen was crash and you get these incredible colors on the screen. Yeah. And like this, a dark uh, sky. Yeah, this, this is my first one, uh, the highway landscape paintings. And uh, uh, in my uh, first uh, solo show in the Art Labor Gallery in <laughs> Shanghai, uh, uh, that solo show, the name is Mute. Uh, because, uh, you know, my studio actually is uh, in the countryside of the Shanghai. I should, uh, if you drive the car, you, um, there may be uh, one hour to go into downtown. So in that, in that time, I, uh, I just watching the, the highway and uh, try to think, okay, uh, this is a uh, human highway. I, I, I don't know why I trust that word, but uh, in that time I just got that word. Because we built this, uh, uh, so many buildings and uh, make so many connections with uh, nature and uh, human culture, so, right. so many stuff, yeah. And uh, this, this is a cut of the mountain, just like the, we cut the mountain, we can see the blood and the skin were deeper and deeper. So I want to try to see a, a very deep level of the nature things. Mm, which yeah. brings you to that, mm. which is the work that's upstairs. Yeah, uh, which yeah. is called phobia. Yeah, is that it's right? a phobia. Uh, so uh, in the, um, 2017, uh, in the time I find another one di direction because uh, the painting for me, uh, I think is uh, just uh, one type of the art. So uh, as a painter, I think I always uh, make so many collection from the, this world from the internet or uh, my memory or dream or even some uh, uh, chat or something. Mm. So, uh, so my work, um, the way of the, my work has had a little bit of change. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, so I, I, I used uh, so many single details uh, became the one of the element of my work. Mm. So uh, I just I just think about the one question is uh, if uh, everyone's everyone think the 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 details is maybe is the best part of the art or something even 
everything. But if you think, uh, uh, try to imagine the, if the, the details became the only one element of the painting, that should be very interesting because detail is a dis disappear. We can mm. see any dis details. Mm. So in this painting, uh, the phobia, uh, I, I, I try to uh, description this mm. word. Uh, I don't want to put any story or experience in there because uh, phobia had a little bit negative or uh, or bad feeling. Uh, but for me, I think it's uh, uh, another one uh, landscape landscape from our deep mind or something. Yeah, that must be everyone that got a single long story in there. So uh, sort of the black hole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we got a real one black hole picture uh, <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's a good work. Thank you very much. It's a good work for us to end on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> because I think one of the really interesting aspects about all of the artists here, and I know that um, if you're available next week on the 16th, uh, another of the artists, Zhu Bing, will be here to talk about his work. But the real key is that uh, if we can find one characteristic to Chinese contemporary art, it is that it's not always what it appears to be on the surface, and that very often ways used to produce it are incredibly complex, labor-intensive, and um, long-winded you know, when we look at the final results. Anyway, so thank you very much for your presentations. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you.